welcome to the pseudo show. This is Brandon. No housekeeping today. Just make sure to get subscribed to the pseudo show YouTube channel, pseudo.show slash YouTube. Make sure to hit subscribe and hit the notification button. There's a lot of great content coming. Today, Bill, Neil, and I get together to talk about open source corporate contributions. This is essentially just expanding on Destination Linux episode 300. So here I give you episode 57 of the pseudo show, Corporate Contributions. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of cloud infrastructure so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building apps that grow your business. With predictable pricing and robust product documentation, get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful cloud computing. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the Touch Digital community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash touch2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of the Pseudo Show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show. So I wanted to pull together an episode after the uh, re most recent Destination Linux episode. Uh, they talked about corporate contributions in open source. I think that corporate contribution in open source has moved the ball forward further than if there was no corporate backing in open source. Some people may disagree. I actually think that a lot of standards have emerged in open source that otherwise wouldn't have. And also another great thing that corporate contributions have done is it is given a lot of developers that want to participate in the in free software and open source a steady paycheck. Not all open source developers and contributors are going to become a founder or they're, and they're not going to figure out a business model to make money off their software. Most contributors just want to sling code. That's what they do. And Neil, I know you're very you're you know you do corporate contributions here. What, what what's your what's your thought there? In the past seven eight years that I've been gainfully employed at my current employer, like they have enabled me to use my knowledge and expertise in open source communities to help support them and to support the communities at large a positive philosophy within the organization about open source development and about open source communities and open source projects can lead to beneficial outcomes for both the communities at large as well as the company that's working in there. This is this thesis that I've operated at Datto for the past seven years. This has allowed us to do a lot of interesting things and solve a lot of problems that most people would not have been able to do conventionally. Like Datto has contributed to Linux kernel, and we contributed to a, uh, to the Fedora project and the CentOS project. Like you'll find people with Datto email addresses all over, all over packages and and source code you know, throughout the various projects that make up these Linux distributions. The Deb Build project, which is a project that I maintain, has been kindly has kindly had sponsored development from Datto because we use the Deb Build project to build our software to ship on Debian and Ubuntu-based systems using RPM packaging, which we consider to be easier for everyone to work with. And it gives us a degree of portability between RPM and Debian systems, 
And so we use it as a unifying factor for packaging software internally. On top of that, the value that that has produced has enabled other people to leverage this technology. The folks at SUSE use DevBuild as well, and they have contributed to the project significantly to build on top of that and vastly improve it, which has benefited us as well. There are many examples of this kind of stuff from many different companies. Most of the time, you don't know that that's what's happening, but that's definitely what's happening. Bill, I wanted to also, you know, before I jump in with a bit more of my thoughts on this, I wanted you to, I know you don't contribute, especially your company, they're, you know, they're more on the, because you're on the MSP side, probably not a ton of open source contributions happening because you're, you know, out there supporting smaller clients. You're just trying to solve a problem. If it in source solution fits, it fits. From your perspective, how has corporate contributions impacted you, whether if that's personally or in your day job? Well, I can think of a very important contribution that makes a difference in my life every day on both fronts, and that is ButterFS. You either love it or you hate it. But I use ButterFS on almost every workstation that I own, including this one, which happens to be running OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. And it's saved my bacon on many occasions when I have to roll back after a bad update or something else goes wrong. And you also see ButterFS now in a number of commercial applications, uh, such as NAS backup solutions, other hardware-based appliances that need that snapshot functionality where ZFS doesn't quite fit just yet. So in terms of corporate support in my everyday life, absolutely. And I feel like without contributions to ButterFS, and again, you might love it or hate it, we wouldn't be as far advanced today as we could be otherwise. One of the things that I, when we were prepping for this, that I, that I wrote down, I mean, a lot of a lot of open source projects in particular have emerged out of really, they, they came out of nowhere in some cases, like a lot, maybe not out of nowhere, but they kind of revolutionized how we uh, do things. And, and they were contributions from players that you never would expect to contribute. And it's it had a huge impact on the industry. One of the things I wrote down was Cassandra. The Cassandra database came out of Facebook, if my memory is correct. Now Cassandra is being used to power websites all over the world and other, and other applications, of course. It's a highly distributable, very capable database. From my perspective, it kind of came came out of the blue and it's uh, made a huge impact on the industry. I mean, also the same with Kubernetes, like Kubernetes emerged out of Google kind of, you know, everyone knew that Google had a huge distributed uh, system and orchestration system, but now Kubernetes is out there, love it or hate it as well. You know, it's uh, now powering um, application modernization initiatives and, starting to run new applications all over the globe. You know, it's m made a lot of things easier in our everyday lives, whether we recognize it or not. And you bring up ButterFS. ButterFS was not meant to be used in a consumer context. It was meant to be in a data center. But now it's being used in consumer NASs. It's being used, oh, on a, it's being used on my workstation. You know, I use Fedora workstation. Thank you, Neil, for your contributions to Fedora to make that happen. And I know that was uh, also out of um, kind of uh, if you know talking to you. It was not just out of. I know you you wanted to be able to not just use it on your day to day workstation. You wanted to be able to help others address a need, and ButterFS solved that. Yeah, and you know I didn't do it alone. Right, like so, I was operating in a personal capacity to get this done, but I was working with the wonderful folks at Facebook who develop this technology these days, who were very interested in bringing it to a wider audience and directly contributing and supporting it there because they are using it for their own workstations, their own servers, their own cloud instances, their own everything, and they wanted to make that more available to everyone, and I was willing to help them make it happen. 
And so that's that's how that that's how it lined. And that's a great example of community and corporate um, interests aligning together to make something awesome happen. When I was listening to the uh, to DL, one of the things that that caught I was listening to it live. You know, it was the 300 episode, and one of the projects that was, that was brought up is uh, LibreOffice. Just give the hi- quick history lesson on it. You know, it started back in the 90s as Star Office. It mo- became Open Office after uh, Sun acquired uh, Star Systems, and then then Sun was acquired by Oracle, and then. LibreOffice branched off and as a hard fork created Document Foundation. And it's backed by some really great companies that have created products around it. Collabra, for example, is one of the core backers and the core contributor to LibreOffice. Red Hat has uh, developers working on LibreOffice. Um, and it's, but it's not something that's core to the business. It's, it's just uh, something that's being done as part of being being a maybe a good open source citizen but there's tons of projects that, you know, that I know that Red Hat works on that never see the light of day as a product but then become very important components of Linux distributions like a lot of the work in GNOME there's work elsewhere that that's not uh it doesn't it's not exactly tied directly to revenue well, let's switch gears for a minute because you and Neil have talked so much about software contributions or file systems, but I want to go a little bit more low level than that. And I want to talk about contributions to our Linux kernel that happen behind the scenes and so many things that go into it, which all of us take for granted. And one of the first companies that comes to mind is actually Intel. And think about the contributions that Intel has made to open source. So for the both of you guys, what do you think Intel has contributed the most to open source that has also impacted you the most? Well, Intel is the number one contributor to the kernel. Uh, They have been for the last five or six years. I know it's not exactly out of the goodness of their heart. I mean, they, uh, it's important for Intel hardware to work great on Linux since Linux powers the data center, powers the cloud. So everything needs to work great, but there's uh, things in the kernel that they've worked on that may not, that's not tied back to that core business. It's uh, actually has a huge impact on my ability to use a desktop, a Linux desktop or a tablet. Actually, a lot of the contributions Intel's made into to, into display and other other human interface devices have actually been for touch devices. Uh, there's some things that now need to be rewritten and, pro- and may or may take a while to happen, so you can use like newer devices like the X1 Fold and others. But there's a lot of work that's gone in to the kernel that I know Intel has done that, is, that isn't necessarily tied to their work in the data center. When you talk about touch devices, I think about the schools that I work with and how those touch devices help children of all ages learn every day on a variety of hardware platforms and devices. And without that touch interface being readily available and sure call it a Chromebook if you want under the hood that's still a Linux kernel with a contribution from Intel making a touch screen happen but I also we can't as a team forget to discuss AMD in this conversation as well because for those of us that are using AMD graphics AMD open sources their kernel drivers for their GPUs which makes gaming on Linux, a relatively pleasant experience. Our AMD's contributions have been uh, significant, especially in the, in the video stack, in the graphics stack. You know, going back to Intel, a lot of their more recent contributions have been around, uh, that have been around ARC, are actually really interesting. I was actually just noticing some benchmarks on the new ARC 
uh, GPUs on Twitter. I would I need to get my hands on an Arc GPU now. I want to verify it. It outperforms Windows. It, it Intel Arc is better on Linux than it is on Windows. So I, that's something I'm I'm looking forward to seeing. I don't know if it's just because it it's just easier to deal with the Linux ecosystem because there's not a lot of baggage. That you don't need to worry about DirectX layer, all the DirectX layers. I have a more prosaic reason for why it is. It's because those drivers on Windows have to be solely developed by Intel, all over from scratch. Maybe not entirely from scratch. They could reuse some bits of it from the Intel IGP drivers, but the drivers that are used in Linux are built on this larger shared framework of all the other stuff that's been used in the Linux kernel that's in Mesa and all these things, and benefit from the work that people have been doing for the other GPUs, for the whole system, for all the disparate configurations. And that means that there are more people looking at it, working on it, trying to make every bit of performance come out of their equipment, uh, whether they're from Intel, AMD, or somebody else, or even just some schmo, who's got a computer and notices that his game that he's playing for some reason is being wibbly with the FPS and goes and tracks it down and and works with the Mesa people to figure it out. Like, all that little stuff happens all the time. And that collaboration between the folks that work in these companies to, to develop open source software and the peoples in these communities that also do this is where we get this, forgive the, the, the corporateness, the synergy that leads to a greater uh, force multiplier of development and success. It goes to the power of open source. Everyone benefits. I, I've mentioned this I, on previous episodes. A lot of the work that went into Android for the kernel, it, specifically in the Linux kernel for Android, was around bringing better power efficiency so that your battery on your phone would last more than an hour. That benefit of improving efficiency in the kernel for power management had a huge impact on data centers because when servers went idle, they would draw less power because of those contributions. Again, this was uh, something that was selfish. You know, this was Google wanting to create a phone operating system that was based on the Linux kernel. But in order to make that happen, they had to make those changes. So we had some benefits that didn't just uh, help Google. It helped everyone. Helped anyone that was been running Linux on on their laptop. Like when I, I've been running Linux on a laptop since 2001. And I remember battery life on my first ThinkPad on Windows was like two or three hours. Second, I installed SUSE Linux on it. It was like a, an hour. And in some cases, not always, like my more recent computers, I've had better battery life on Linux than on Windows. Like I've done, just did some testing on a, the uh, ThinkPad X13 Gen 3 AMD. And I'm easily getting eight, nine hours of battery life on the smaller battery. And that's from everyday use, you know, I'm obviously putting it to sleep, opening it back up, but it's lasting all day. Yeah, that's something I never thought I'd ever say just five years ago about running Linux on a, on a laptop. It goes to show you that necessity is the mother of invention. Because without people working at companies together to solve a common problem, there may not be enough initiative or desire to solve a problem like what you just mentioned with battery life on a phone. I think one of the biggest problems and pet peeves that we run into over time is decreased battery life on a phone. And I can tell you from having traveled to many cities through many airports that losing battery in my phone is probably one of the most frustrating experiences I've gone through. So thank you to everybody who has contributed open source code to ensure that I have a better battery life in my phone when I'm traveling around to different clients. You, you bring up a good point, Bill. But one of the things that I've harped on before is 
open source sustainability, being it paying contributors, paying uh, paying maintainers in some way. I, you know, maybe you can't pay every contributor, but you can at least pay the you know paying the maintainers uh, of projects. I did a monologue earlier this year, which was basically uh, the thesis is open source developers, uh, you know, they can't eat code. Yeah, you know, they can't they can't buy uh, food with code. They need money. That's what the corporate path does. If you are an open source contributor, if uh, lucky enough to work for a company that it allows you to do that contribution, you get your you, know, you get a steady paycheck to work on a project that you that you like, that you've started, that you love. So that that's why I think it's really important. Yeah, you know, I know a, a lot of people that try to do it on their spare time, but then I actually think it's important for corporations to actually uh, have a, a contribution policy of some kind so that developers can contribute to open source projects. So I know some places, you know, they really like their intellectual property. So any idea that you happen to come up with in your head, you know, they want to try to claim that they own could, there should be some sort of, could be, should be some sort of middle ground that allows a developer to go contribute on their off time or, even during the day, you know, during their day job. Like if you're, I don't know a single enterprise that doesn't use an open source library or some sort of open source project that they could let their team contribute to the projects that they use. I've heard of a number of companies now allowing their employees a set amount of time in a week, call it four hours, maybe even eight hours. And that time is their time to work on projects that they feel are interesting to them, whether it's open source or even closed source. But the fact of the matter is, is that developers are creators in some way, shape, or form. They have a creative mind. They have a vision for a piece of software that they take from their brain, transfer it through their, key, through their fingers onto the keyboard, and make a product. They're creators. And... People like that, developers, and please correct me if I'm wrong, need a space and a time to allow that creative flow to be output into something useful. And I really tip my hat to those companies that say, you know what, just as much as your time is valuable to us, our time is valuable to you as well. And therefore, we're going to grant you the means and the space to work on something that you like, work on something that inspires you and motivates you. And what happens is, is you end up with more satisfied employees that want to stay loyal to your organization and also give more back to the open source community. As someone who has gone through this whole, th one of the easiest ways to keep people, software developer types in particular, happy and engaged in in, in your company is to give them the ability to exercise those skills for the benefit of the larger communities. People care about that kind of stuff and especially in nowadays where the usage of open source is essentially commonplace and more or less a requirement to make a successful product or service. Nobody is going to find that 100% of the things that they're using is going to work 100% of the way that they want to 100% of the time. And when it doesn't, giving them the freedom and flexibility to be able to fix it properly for everyone and maybe even just use it as an opportunity to give some credit back to the company for allowing it to happen. Like there, there's a, a mutually beneficial arrangement happening there where the developer gets to do the thing and the company gets to hopefully look a little better in the process. And those are always opportunities to support these these communities and these projects. If you can't get if you're not able to give back with money, being able to give back with effort and contributions and another means of support is just as valuable and just as desirable. And if you you know, we've we've talked about how open source developers also need to eat and they would also like their projects to succeed and all these other things they can't live off of github stars but it can be easier for them to not have to take on all the burden if the burden is being shared by other people i think the other day i was reading about a project that is contemplating relicensing from an open source license to uh, a non-open source one because they're receiving no 
developer contributions. They're receiving no financial contributions from anyone who's actually using it. It's putting a tremendous strain on them to, to maintain the project. It's clearly very successful. People really rave about it. It's not getting the support it needs. And so this developer is in a dilemma. We really should not make it harder for people who are appropriately skilled and gainfully employed to be able to support each other so that those things can come back and benefit you later. Like, I could not tell you the number of times that I've stepped out a little bit, done a little fix up here or there in, in a random project A or B that has come back to benefit me a couple of weeks down the road, a couple of months down the road, sometimes even a couple of years down the road. You just never know. It always It's all about paying it forward and helping each other be successful. I'm going to quote, uh, oh, I'm going to paraphrase uh, from Star Trek Deep Space Nine, a quote from Quark, which was in the, I think it was the second to last episode of Deep Space Nine. Uh, software subscriptions go against the very spirit of free software. That's why they call it free. This has been references to taxes and uh, free and free enterprise. But that's, uh, I, I feel like uh, the, it's kind of been the sins of the past, uh, specifically or er, very early on, where we made it seem so easy and money was grow, you know, money grew on trees. But also back in the 90s, a lot of this was done by very successful companies, obviously done by a lot of very talented individuals as well. But in the 90s, we had VA Linux, we had Red Hat, we had SUSE making tons of contributions uh cygnus as well uh doing uh now it's but now we're still down to the handful of companies but now there's more developers getting involved in open source more a lot of new companies that like that are doing things like like uh fleet dm they're you know they're one of the core contributors to os query obviously red hat is still here to you know contributing you know number two contributor kubernetes kernel number one uh, contributor of all time to OpenStack. Still a lot of that happening, but like the the smaller ones, I'll actually still use Fleet. You know, they're small when you don't pay for it, pull it down and use their software. It's great that they're getting adoption, but like Neil said, they can't live off, uh, you can't run a business off GitHub uh, stars. Goes back if you derive value from an open source project to donate to it at the very minimum, like as an individual, right after Destination Linux, at the end of Destination Linux, they donated to two projects, Caden Live and, and uh, the Document Foundation. I matched the contribution to the Document Foundation dollar for dollar. I actually did that contribution today as of this recording. Uh, so that probably was uh, November. Yeah, it was November 15th. So make sure to go check out, go check out the donation pages. If you can afford to do it, donate to a project. I think it's important to keep this sustainable. This is something I'm not going to stop harping on. This is something I'm very passionate about, obviously. I think I've gone on a tirade on the podcast on this, not just in the monologue. I think uh, at least three or four other times. We're, we're all on the same page here. Free does not imply that it is value less of no value. Free, free is about, to put it tritely, free is in freedom, right? But what free means, really, is flexibility, fungibility, feasibility. I could keep going for more F-words, but that, those were the ones that I could come up with. Thinking about free software, I'm also reminded of an old slogan that I think many of our listeners probably haven't heard, but I, it still sticks with me and I love it. It's Cygnus's, Cygnus Solutions' old slogan was making free software affordable. I thought it was so cheesy and fun, but a lot of people didn't quite get it, and, and I'll explain here. It means that the cost of adoption and maintenance and leveraging that software is not zero. Someone has to put in that effort, and someone has to be paid for that effort. What Cygnus pioneered was the idea of them taking on that effort to help you adopt it, whether that's by simply training people, as which is what a lot of companies do today, but also adapting the software to support your needs and then doing it in such a way that everyone else benefits down the road so that the incremental cost of supporting a new use case and a new customer goes down over time, making the business scale. That was Cygnus's secret sauce that Red Hat adopted and it massively scaled out beyond what anyone could have expected. I think another way that individuals can contribute via companies is by choosing to do business with companies that support 
open source either directly or indirectly. I can tell you that with Amazon, you can sign up to donate to a nonprofit of your choice through smile.amazon.com. And I tell everybody to use that when they consider buying products from Amazon is at least to get some of that back into the pockets of the open source foundations that need it. We use it at work. We donate to an open source foundation. And it's very nice to see that little email come through once a quarter from Amazon saying, hey, we were able to contribute X amount of dollars to the charity that you've chosen. So I would implore our listeners out there to find companies that will contribute to open source if you have a choice in doing so. And importantly, as Bill noted, it doesn't have to be in code or effort. It can also be in money and supporting the organizations that help support the developers to develop and maintain the software. You know, when when we were talking about uh, Academy, Brandon and I with Nate Graham, we put our money where our mouths is. And like there, KDE got, you know, a donation. That helps support those experts and users and contributors and supporters to keep doing what they're doing. That's just as important. That concludes this episode of The Pseudo Show. Head on over to YouTube slash Pseudo Show and make sure to get subscribed and hit that notification button. Make sure you don't miss any content from The Pseudo Show Podcast or Pseudo Show Labs. And head on over to TuxDigital.com for ways to engage in the conversation, whether that's on the forum or on the Discord channel. Thanks again for listening to The Pseudo Show Podcast, where business meets open source.